this episode will be tentatively divided into two parts. In the first one, we'll share with you if there are no Nazis in Ukraine. In the second one, you'll hear the story of a person who nearly died at his home in Bucha, near Kyiv, but managed to gather strength and survive. <laughs> this is UA, the day that we survived. Ukrainian journalists have come together to create it with real people who record themselves and send us their stories. The Russian propaganda has been hammering down the message about neo-Nazis in Ukraine for many years. When Russia started the war in Ukraine, it declared denazification as one of the tasks Russia pursues. Let's get to the bottom of this. Are there real Nazis in Ukraine? Why has this topic even come up? The first and the simplest arguments to confirm the Russians are lying. There is not a single right or far-right political party in the Ukrainian parliament. Ukrainian conservative nationalistic party called Svoboda got 2.15% of the votes at the last elections, not even enough to cross the threshold to Verkhovna Rada, the parliament of Ukraine. Other far-right political formations did not even participate in the elections. Just to compare, representatives of the right parties constitute more than 25% of the parliament in Hungary, Austria and Switzerland. Russia started telling its tale about Nazis during the Revolution of Dignity in 2013-2014. Then Ukrainian citizens protested against President Viktor Yanukovych, who hijacked power and refused to follow the course of EU integration fixed on the legislative level. Ukrainians protested on the central square in Kyiv for several months. Then law enforcement used weapons. More than a hundred people died, and Viktor Yanukovych escaped to Russia. For Russia itself, where power has not really changed in the last 22 years, such manifestation of public resistance is unacceptable. Russians call the Ukrainian revolution the coup, while the absolute majority of people at the central square in Kyiv were unarmed. We didn't read this on the internet, we witnessed it ourselves. After the revolution of dignity, Ukraine held democratic elections twice to elect both the president and the government. The international community confirmed the legal standing of these elections. Another argument against denazification – Ukraine does not spread its so-called ideology to neighboring countries, does not occupy neighboring territories. Russia, on the other hand, used the saving Russian speakers propaganda to occupy the Ukrainian Crimea back in 2014 and encouraged the formation of the self-proclaimed breakaway so-called Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. For eight years, Ukraine has been talking about the Russian-Ukrainian war in the east of Ukraine. Russia supported terrorist formations of DLPR, although never confirmed it officially. Up until the 22nd of February, when Putin ordered the Russian Ministry of Defense to ensure the realization of peacemaking functions by the Russian armed forces in DLPR, according to the order to recognize Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republics. That order meant military intervention of the Russian army to the occupied Donbass. Ukraine is a multinational state. Jews, Greeks, Arabs, Armenians and many other nations live in peace here. The law of Ukraine on the condemnation of the communist and national socialist Nazi regimes and prohibition of propaganda of bare symbols is in force. Even President Volodymyr Zelensky is of Jews' descent. In his official speeches he used and keeps using the Russian language. Dehumanization of other nations is more of a Russian prerogative. Before the war in 2022, it actively promoted thesis to justify aggression toward Ukraine. The Ukrainians don't have a nation, don't have statehood, etc. Russia uses the term Nessus to explain in any way the reason it attacked our country. Yes, there are far-right movements in Ukraine, just like in any other country. The Azov regiment is getting the most criticism in this regard. However, the Ministry of Internal Affairs of Ukraine controls Azov entirely. 
The armed forces of Ukraine, which take orders from the Ministry of Defense of Ukraine, are definitely blameless. In the process of so-called denazification, the Russian government continues to affirm that it did not attack Ukraine and does not shoot its civilians. At the same time, Russian occupiers carried out an airstrike on a hospital and a maternity ward in Mariupol. Russia admitted that bombed the maternity ward deliberately. Russian Ministry of the Foreign Affairs Serhii Lavrov confirmed that at a press conference in Antalya after the meeting with Dmitry Kuleba, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine. And the Minister of Defense of Ukraine stated that since the 24th of February the Russian occupiers have already killed more civilian Ukrainians than the military. The Russian Minister of Defense officially admitted the conscripts fighting in the war with Ukraine. The ministry confirmed several facts of conscript military's presence and claims that nearly all conscripts have been ordered to the Russian territory. According to Ukrainian data, total combat losses of the enemy from the 24th of February to the 10th of March are approximately 12,000 people. <laughs> Meanwhile, evacuation from small towns near Kiev continues. Dmitry Tkachuk and his family walked 17 kilometers under fire to save themselves. 2022 Europe. He wrote this text on his Facebook page, and with his permission, we share it. Read by Tom Cox. We managed to escape. The day before yesterday, in the morning, we escaped from Bucha to Irpin, and in the afternoon, from Irpin to Kiev. We all escaped and survived. I feel like I've been born again. I'm sharing this story so that those who find themselves in the city occupied by the enemy in a similar situation can know that they can get out of this alive. But in this case, you need to take a huge risk. Also. I hope that those of you who are safe right now would not fall into the trap I fell into when I thought the war would not affect my family. I was wrong. This is a war. There are no rules or guarantees. The war caught my family in Bucha. On February 24th, I was in a private home with four women taking care of the household. My mother, sister, and two grandmothers who are 74 and 83 years old. My father was in Kiev. He didn't manage to join us. In the beginning, we felt relatively safe in Bucha. It was possible to quickly get to Kiev and send the family to the west by the Warshavka route. But the war doesn't care about your logistical plans. It comes when you expect it the least. It happened to us. Out of all the military bases and critical infrastructures of our country, those scumbags started the invasion from Gostomel, a cargo airbase located five kilometers to the north of our house in Bucha. Right on the second day of the war, our guys from the Ukrainian armed forces blew up the bridge to Kiev East, and from the west, the Orcs started their invasion of Borodyanka and Vorsel. Shortly after, the battle unfolded in Bucha. There were explosions from every side of our house. The windows blew off almost each side. We were surrounded. At the same time, we still thought that if we were peaceful, unarmed civilians, no one would hurt us. We were wrong. Approximately on the third day, our electricity, internet and mobile connection were cut off. Locals said they saw orcs cutting cables on cell towers. We remained completely blind. You could spend hours staring at your phone, at the circle next to the messages in Telegram, which gives you hope that the messages will be sent. But no, nothing comes in and nothing goes out. We heard shell explosions all the time, sometimes less loud, sometimes so loud that it seemed like they had exploded in the yard of our house. Sometimes, after particularly loud explosions from the Gostmul side and Kiev, the sky turned crimson. 
It looked like it was bleeding. On top of all of this, we could hear the sound of fighter aircraft, which, for some reason, was heard only early in the morning. I would even say that this sound reminds you of a low but loud whistle that gets louder as the plane approaches, and every time your brain whispers to you that the fighter aircraft will drop the bomb on your house, it will blow up and kill your entire family. Sometimes the wind brought us a phone signal. After charging my phone with a power bank, I immediately reached out to my friends from the armed forces and asked what to do with my family. Can they be rescued somehow? In response, I was told that the situation in our region was critical. We had to lie low and wait for our guys to finish a fighter sweep. We did not panic. I believed in the armed forces and was waiting. We still had to go outside. I didn't know how long we would stay in Butcher. There would only be enough food for about a week. Every few days we went out into the city in search of supplies. The shops were closed. There was no information about humanitarian aid. The city council was silent. Sometimes we were lucky. One day, the employees of the Echo Market decided to distribute leftover food to the citizens. Honestly, it looked awful. Hundreds of people tried to grab at least a pack of tea or an orange. In early March, we went outside to get water from the street water pump walked to the end of the street and stumbled across the enemy fighting vehicle. The letter V was painted on it. Two demons with white stripes on their arms were standing near the car and staring at us. We turned around very slowly and returned home. The mind was paralyzed with fear, but the body moved. The next day, we still had to go and get water because we didn't have a choice. So we went. We thought we would stay at home. We thought we were safe, because why would the enemy bomb a private neighborhood? Meanwhile, there was no green corridor. We could hear the sound of explosions and gunshots on the street. Fighter aircrafts continued to fly over the house. We moved to a cold basement, which is around five to seven degrees. We thought it would be safer like this. And we thought like this up until March 5th, the day when an enemy tank entered our street. In front of my eyes, those bastards first targeted a neighboring house that was one house away. Then they aimed at the church dome, which was 70 meters away. The noise was as if all of the bells of the world rang simultaneously. I don't know how our windows withstood it. I don't know how my ears managed to recognize any other sound afterwards. After that, My sister and I saw a sprinter car stop in front of the church. The driver and passengers stepped out and lay down behind the car. I think they were hiding from the enemy. These poor people made a white flag on a stick and from time to time showed it to the enemy, but there was no reaction. So they continued to lie on the ground, hoping that they would not be hit by a tank. From the top floor of our house, We could see the upper floors of a nine-story building close to the city centre were on fire. At the same time, we could see from our window how columns of orcs with white armbands began wandering along the neighbouring streets. They went in groups of five to seven. They kept a distance of one metre between each other. They were looking through the windows of houses. We realised that we could no longer stay and wait for the green corridor. Even if no one breaks into the house, nobody could guarantee that a projectile would not land on the roof of our house and blow our family up. And if not a shell, sooner or later we will run out of food. What could we do in this case? And if an evacuation happens but we didn't know about it because we have no connection, what then? My sister and I started negotiating with our grandmothers, who did not accept any ideas about our evacuation. Our maternal grandmother lived all her life in the Butcher region and was not going to leave her home. Believe me, these were some of the most difficult negotiations in my life, but we managed to convince her. In the morning, we gathered all of the necessary things and went outside. Neighbors noticed us. They understood everything without any words, called us and said that they were coming with us. As a result, there were seven of us, not counting the small dog. 
We left the house that our grandfather built with his bare hands and as well as everything that was in it. And we went in the direction where the explosions were the loudest, to Irpin. Immediately on the next street, we met a local man. Where are you going, he said. There's an enemy checkpoint 300 meters away. You're going to be shot dead. That was the first, but not the last time we heard those words that day. But every time we looked at each other, we knew we had to move on. We just couldn't stay. It's good that Lesova Bucha is a place where my mother and grandmother grew up. They know every path there, every tree. We bypassed the checkpoint the 10th way, went to the pond, and went to Irpin across a place where we learned to swim in our childhood. Across the place where shells were constantly flying between Irpin and Bucha, where buildings were burning and producing thick black smoke. It seemed that with each explosion, my hair turned more and more grey. There was a strong smell of pyrotechnics in the air. I used to like it. Now, I hate it. We walked slowly because both grandmothers were squeezing all the energy they had out of themselves. My mother was very worried this could kill them. I thought that if not this, then a random projectile would kill us all. That's why we had to go. And we went. We crept through the bushes and off-road until we finally saw the first checkpoint. Our checkpoint. It means that we managed to bypass the enemy and leave the city. Occupied Bucha was left behind. At the entrance to Irpin, we were met by our guys from the Territorial Defense Forces. When I saw a blue and yellow stripe on the soldier's hand, my legs gave way for a moment from a feeling of relief. I always loved our flag, but I've never been so happy to see it in my entire life. But in Irpin, we received more disappointment. There was no connection, public transport, or cars. Later, we understood why. 50 meters further, we saw Irpin's new buildings completely destroyed. It was as if a tornado swept everything away. We looked at these houses and saw wrecks of kitchens, remnants of bedrooms, wallpapers in the nursery, and pieces of mirrors in the bathroom. We imagined that somebody was saving money to build this house. Somebody was probably going to live their lives there. We were staring at it, and we knew that this could happen to our house. It was especially sad to look at the ad billboard in front of a completely destroyed house, which said, finally, you can afford your own house. Unfortunately, many Irpin citizens were left with no roofs and money. We had no choice but to cross the city towards Ramanivka the southern neighborhood of Irpin, where people were supposed to be evacuated. This information was unconfirmed. People kept telling us that we were crazy, that it was dangerous to go there, that it was just announced on the radio that a family with young people had been killed there. But we had nowhere to go. We left occupied Bucha behind. Irpin was bombed on all fronts. Houses around were burning everywhere. Just a few minutes ago, they were bombed. We saw people's covered bodies lying on the street. It was awful. It was impossible to stay in Irpin, so we moved on. My grandmothers were super tired. I think the only thing that kept them on their feet was adrenaline and the desire to survive. I did not know where Romanivka was, but I heard where the most powerful explosions came from. My gut feeling told me we needed to go there. We found a church on our way. We were told that people were evacuated from here yesterday. A local pastor met us and said that going to Romanivka was incredibly dangerous. He said that people were dying there. Stay with us, he said. We will feed you. We have already accommodated up to 200 people. The church was warm and crowded. There were places to sleep. My body gave me a clear signal that it was ready to fall on the next chair and not stand up until the next morning. But the brain had always won this competition so far. A few minutes later, several men in military uniforms entered the door. The situation is getting worse, said one of them. The green corridor is closing. Yesterday, we were crossing the territory by car. Today, you can only cross the field by foot. We exchanged glances with our neighbor and realized we had to go. Even run. Now. One of the grandmothers began to lose strength in her legs. She just couldn't go without support. She was scared and in pain. 
We approached the last checkpoint of our guys in Irupin. Then there was only a field, a road, and a bridge over the river Irupin. It was the road to Kiev. There were a few dozen houses behind the bridge, which made up Romanivka. There were evacuation buses behind it. There were supposed to be homes behind it. Get down, shouted one of the soldiers. We all quickly got down on the ground. The whistling of a projectile. Three, two, one, explosion. Somewhere around a hundred meters away. They've been bombarding us for five hours in a row already. You need to go in that direction, he said. Go a little less than a kilometre down the road across the field. After the field, hide under the destroyed bridge. You will understand everything there. If you hear the projectile sound, you will have seven to two seconds to get down on the ground. Get down each time. And we left. We got down on the ground 20 times. Right after we started walking across the field, two things happened. The shell hit two houses on both sides of the bridge. Suddenly everything began to burn and the sky was covered with black smog. The second, my grandmother's legs refused to function. She just couldn't go. It happened after we left the checkpoint and we didn't have any shelter. In such moments, your brain just stops working. You do everything to survive. My sister and I took my grandmother by her arms and began to literally drag her with us. In one hand, my grandmother. In the other hand, a huge bag with all our valuable belongings. Another projectile whistled above our heads. We got down on the ground. It hit an unfinished house somewhere on the left. I got back on my feet, grabbed my grandmother, picked up my sister and we ran it again. Mum and another grandmother and neighbours headed towards the bridge. A whistle, again. A few seconds and another projectile hits the bridge. Grandma shouts that we should leave her there and run to the bridge ourselves. If it's not hell, then what? I don't know how we reached it. I remember the soldiers were standing there and waving at us to get under the bridge. When we finally got under it, we saw that it, there were around 40 civilians beside us. Everyone was scared. They stood under the bridge abutment because there was less chance that you would be buried under the bridge wrecks after the next bombing. We were not allowed to the opposite side of the river. The armed forces made it clear that, that another projectile could explode at any moment. I think they were waiting for the command from leadership. We were so close to Kiev, just hundreds of meters and your home. Another whistling sound, this time a double one. Two shells exploded in the field to our right. We were so close and so far away at the same time. I stood under the bridge watching people tremble and cry nearby and thought that Russia made me a refugee in my own home. They want to bury me in my own home. At that moment, suddenly a thought popped in my head. A powerful internal protest. I began to re repeat to myself that I was not going to die here. Not today, not near Irpin, and not as a result of Russian aggression. The soldier gave a signal that we needed to move quickly to the river. We rushed forward, I, my sister, grandmother between us, and a bag with belongings. The soldiers put a 40 centimeter wide wooden plank across the river. People were carrying a woman in a wheelchair in front of us. Two soldiers quickly approached them, took the woman, and slowly carried her to the other riverside. You know, although it was a hard time, at that moment I wanted to stop and just applaud the guys. It was a powerful act of some of the most basic humanity in a time of deep crisis. Mum and Grandma went first. My dear grandmother, in her 83 years, showed unbelievable endurance, courage and grace to quickly move to the other side. Marissa and I were helping our other grandmother. Just not a shell. Just not a shell, please, I repeated to myself because there was nowhere to hide. Step by step, and we're finally on the other side of the river. The next episode in my head is constantly on repeat, like in slow motion. I look up and see soldiers waving at us and shouting, run, run. There are two houses on fire. We're very close to our checkpoint, and I understand that a shell can explode at any moment. But I can't run, because I'm carrying my grandma who cannot walk, and keep shouting that she can't cope with this anymore. But we left, run as much as we could, but we still couldn't keep up with the others and we were left behind. 
We probably wouldn't have left that bridge if a bus hadn't approached us at that very moment. The door opened and we see a woman in a wheelchair sitting and a few other people sitting there. There was almost no space in the bus, so I put my grandma in there, closed the door and ran towards the checkpoint. I ran. My sister and a number of strangers were running nearby. There was a Ukrainian checkpoint in front of us. Two girls in military uniform were standing behind it and waving at us. 50 meters, 45 meters, 40 meters, 30, 20, 10. This long distance seemed to never end, but here we pass by the girls, head to the road in the woods and then run another 50 meters. We're in Kiev, we're home. An ordinary Kiev passenger bus moves towards us, yellow blue, evacuation bus. Mother, grandmother and our neighbors are already sitting inside it. It stops near us. Behind it, my grandmother jumps out of the car. We, along with 40 other people, run inside the bus. Literally a minute and we are already going to Kiev. As we drove through the woods, I couldn't understand what had happened to us. I watched my mother taking our little dog from under her jacket, who she carried on her chest from Bucha. I looked at both of my grandmothers, whose faces had never been so red. I looked into the window. And only when we entered Kiev, I cried. Academis Dechko has never been so precious and beautiful to me. 19 kilometers by foot, with two grandmothers and a dog, under constant fire, bypassing corpses of civilians, we went through hell and survived. Now, when I think about why this happened, it seems to me that it was a price for staying alive. In order to survive during a war, you need to look it in the eyes you can look at it in the eyes in different ways. One, prepare for it and face it fully prepared, standing firmly on both your feet on your own land. Two, try to hide from it and then risk in your lives, run away under the fire from the occupied territories. And three, do not try to leave the occupied territories at all and hope that your home will not blow up during the strike. I understand that at the beginning of the war, I, without realizing it, chose the second option, but never again. I do not encourage anyone to evacuate on their own. This is incredibly dangerous. I believe it is a miracle that I and my family were able to walk this path and remain uninjured. I just want to show by my example that war destroys everything in its path. You can't run away from it, and we must be ready for this. If you feel that you or your loved ones are in danger, think about one, how to move your family to a safe place, and two, what actions you can take to contribute to the victory. Otherwise, one day you may wake up and realize that you need to escape, and you need to do it under crossfire. Believe me, this is not the situation you want to end up in. We're glad that we're alive, and we're incredibly grateful to all of the people who helped get us out of Bucha, and we believe in our army and our victory with all our heart. Glory to Ukraine. P.S. As of today, March 8th, 2022, we haven't had any contact with most of our relatives in Bucha. The footage and information coming from there breaks our hearts. A few days before our journey to Kiev, people from the five and nine story buildings gathered in the basements of old houses and tried to survive the enemy's attack together. There are children and elderly among them. They have no food or water. They have no heating or electricity. These are thousands of people who are now in despair and waiting for help. During the night from 10th to 11th of March, the Russian military showed neighborhoods in Dnipro, central Ukraine, and airfields in Ivano-Frankivsk and Lutsk. These cities are located in the west of Ukraine, just 100 kilometers away from the border to the EU countries. <laughs> Молодец. Давай, качай. 